Welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Victoria Risbro will present PTSD, Identifying Risk and Current and Future Interventions. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $430 million to fund more than 6,200 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Victoria Risbro. Dr. Risbro is professor in residence in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego. She was a 2006 Young Investigator grantee and is a member of our Scientific Council. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Risbro's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Feel free to submit questions at any time. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Risbro. Vicki, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, can everyone see my screen correctly? Can I just get a? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. So thank you so much for that introduction and for the opportunity to speak today. It has been a real pleasure for me to work with BBRF on Scientific Council in supporting cutting edge research in neuropsychiatry. BBRF has been integral for supporting my own research in this field as well as my trainees, and it's been an incredibly important educational resource for caregivers and patients. It's truly an honor to get to participate today in this educational forum. So I just want to quickly show um, some acknowledgments for my funding sources. They include the VA, NIH, DOD, um, as well as BBRF, and uh, the team that, uh, that worked with me on, uh, on these studies, so uh, both at UCSD and Menashe and National Center. So because I know we have a very broad audience today with patients, family members, clinicians, and scientists, I wanted to first provide an overview of PTSD in terms of symptom profiles, prevalence, and current challenges. I will then separate into two parts, one discussion of some of my own work on identifying risk factors for PTSD to understand why some individuals are more at risk for developing PTSD after a trauma exposure. The second part, we want to go over with you the current treatment strategies and what treatments are on the horizon. So PTSD is characterized as a severe chronic somatic and emotional symptoms brought on by a traumatic event. In a given year, three to 4% of the US population has PTSD, which equates to about 8 million people annually. In terms of lifetime prevalence, about eight out of 100 people will develop PTSD in their lifetime, which can be different across populations, such as women have a two times higher prevalence than men, and veterans and individuals in emergency rescue teams, such as firefighters and police, have much higher rates of PTSD. About 85% of the US population will be exposed in their lifetime to a trauma, and about 15% of those will then go on to develop PTSD at some point. Um, out of those traumas, there are a number of different kinds um, that can induce uh, PTSD. So sexual violence is um, one of the primary ones. Uh, rape is the number one uh, predictor of PTSD in women. Interpersonal trauma and violence, which includes uh, witnessing the uh, death or injury of a loved one, as well as assault, are also highly prevalent traumas. Um, exposure to combat or exposure to war, so that includes both military service members as well as refugees. Um, that's also a very common uh, trauma. And natural disasters, such as fire and flood, which we're seeing a lot more uh, in the last coming years due to climate change. And finally, uh, medical accidents um, or medical interventions are also uh, potential 
uh, traumatic events that can drive uh, PTSD. So just to sort of bring that last point home, um, currently we're really seeing um, a, a real problem with PTSD within the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one looming concern, for example, is the high rates of PTSD in COVID-19 survivors. Approximately 30% of individuals that were hospitalized for COVID-19 went on to experience prolonged PTSD and depression symptoms after about six months. PTSD is also endorsed at high rates in healthcare workers with increased risk for symptoms associated with a number of factors, including age, gender, training, uh, environmental safety, so how safe their environment is as they're working, but it's also most strongly associated with reduced social support. So we really need to help support our, uh, our healthcare workers um, because that seems to be one of the primary ways that we can intervene to, to, to prevent um, PTSD. So PTSD is diagnosed by the presence of multiple symptoms that are anchored around the trauma memory. This includes repeated reliving or re-experiencing the event, which is uncontrollable and highly distressing for the individual. This reliving of the trauma is highly aversive because it's accompanied by strong negative emotions like fear or guilt, as well as physical responses such as increased heart rate or dizziness. This produces a drive to avoid reminders of the traumatic event and thinking and talking about the event as well as avoiding cues or triggers associated with the event. Other symptoms include hyperarousal, which is being jittery or overly alert, difficulty sleeping or concentrating, or feeling angry or irritable, and finally negative changes in beliefs and feelings, losing interest in things you used to enjoy, feeling guilty or ashamed, or unable to trust others. It is important to note that these symptoms can wax and wane over time. Individuals may have recovery from a traumatic event, but there may be triggers that can cause reemergence or exacerbation of symptoms. The Afghanistan drawdown, for example, has caused an increase in veterans with PTSD at the VA, in, in symptoms, excuse me, in veterans with PTSD at the VA. I just want to highlight here that there are a number of resources provided by the VA, see the links here, to aid veterans in processing this drawdown, as well as resources for families and clinicians. I also want to highlight some recent work with Israeli soldiers suggesting that spouses of veterans with PTSD can also develop some similar symptoms through indirect exposure to the trauma that their loved ones experienced. So here you can see lots of different symptoms of PTSD and here's symptom severity. In orange, you see the spouse's endorsed symptoms and in blue, you see the, uh, the veterans here. Spouses particularly endorse hyperarousal symptoms, difficulty concentrating and sleep problems. Um, luckily, these symptoms do not reach the severity level of their partners, and they do recover more quickly. Thus, PTSD does not only affect individuals, but the family members as well, and this needs to be considered in interventions. So what do we know about the brain mechanisms of PTSD? From imaging studies as well as basic studies in animals, we have a growing understanding of the brain circuits involved in processing, storing, and reacting to trauma memories and trauma cues. The ability to identify and predict danger is key to our survival, thus we are very good at remembering dangerous or highly aversive events so we can use those memories to help us avoid them in the future. During the traumatic event, our brains, in particular the amygdala, are recording all of the auditory, visual, and sensory stimuli associated with that event. For example, a soldier may experience a bombing during a checkpoint on a bridge. The soldier will associate many of the cues that were present at that time with the trauma, the bangs, the screams and shouts, the smell of burning, the bridge, and other small cues like trash on the ground where the bomb was located. These sorts of stimuli will now activate the amygdala and trigger fear and anxiety responses, which will then drive behavior to avoid or escape what is likely a dangerous or aversive situation. During recovery, the brain learns that over time, those stimuli, when presented again and again, without the advent of danger or trauma, no longer predict danger. And the brain blocks the, the amygdala responses to those cues. This relearning that trauma-related cues no longer predict danger is called fear extinction. And this fear extinction is mediated through the prefrontal cortex, which has direct inhibitory connections to the amygdala. The hippocampus here is also helps block responses to these cues when they occur in different contexts like hearing screams and shouts at a party. The hippocampus recognizes that the trauma cues in a safe environment do not predict danger and block the amygdala from responding. 
Thus, these three regions make up the threat circuit, controlling the output of the amygdala so that we can respond to threat when it's appropriate. In PTSD, there is evidence that the regions that help stop the amygdala activity when it's inappropriate, either in a safe environment or if the cue no longer predicts threat, uh, they will block the amygdala from, um, from responding. However, these appear to function less well in patients with PTSD. I should note that this fear extinction process where the cue is presented over and over again or experienced over and over again, and you lose your fear responses to that cue over time is called fear extinction. And it's one of the critical components in PTSD behavioral therapies. And this will be a theme throughout the talk. I also just want to note that it is not only linked to changes in the brain, but it's also linked to multiple physical health comorbidities, which are receiving greater attention. In conjunction with the behavioral symptoms with PTSD, PTSD is comorbid with cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, and autoimmune disorders. The link to these comorbidities is likely complex, coming from both changes in lifestyle that occur in PTSD, as well as potentially shared genetic and environmental risk factors, such as childhood adversity. With this link to a number of physical health problems, there is a growing awareness in not only psychiatry, but medicine, that these links must be better understood and that the PTSD diagnosis must be taken into account when managing these physical health problems. For example, an individual with cardiovascular disease and PTSD has a two times greater likelihood of mortality after having a heart attack compared to someone without PTSD that has a heart attack. Thus, there's growing attention to understanding the common risk factors and causal mechanisms explaining the link between these physical comorbidities in PTSD, like cardiovascular disease. We also are learning that there are many different trajectories of symptom manifestation after trauma. This is a study from Australia examining six-year trajectory of PTSD symptoms in civilians after a hospital admit for a severe injury, e.g. car assault, a car accident, or sexual assault. They found that study participants fell into five different types of trauma response trajectories. 73% of people showed limited symptoms and these waned over time. And this is good. So these are the resilient group down here in blue. Some showed relatively low symptoms at first. However, symptoms began to rise within a year of trauma and then either resolved within six years or continued to worsen. There is also this group here that had high symptoms to start with and about half of them recovered over six years, half about remained uh, chronic. So there's about 10 to 15%, again, that had uh, significant symptoms at the six-year uh, point. These indicate that there are a number of different trajectories that can be experienced, and we don't have a good handle on identifying who may, may experience which trajectory, if there are potentially risk factors at baseline, but also environmental factors during those six-year periods that are causing those symptoms to wax or wane. So we know that about 15% of people that are exposed to trauma go on to develop PTSD. But we don't know why some people develop it and others do not. The field has sought to understand what the individual risk factors are for developing PTSD to better understand mechanisms of PTSD and identifying individuals with high risk for possible intervention and to understand what interventions may be important. Epidemiological studies suggest that there are a number of psychosocial factors that contribute to risk including gender, so again, we know that women are more likely than men to develop PTSD, socioeconomic status, and most importantly, history of trauma. History of trauma is one of the better predictors with studies showing that with repeated traumas, for example, in the case of military going on for extensive repeated deployments, likelihood of developing PTSD goes up exponentially with each deployment. We know less about biological factors, such as individual differences in brain and body function that might contribute to risk. One reason for that is that it's difficult to disentangle what phenotypes are associated with PTSD and which ones were actually present before trauma. So one approach to answer this question is to use prospective longitudinal studies to examine potential risk factors before actual trauma exposure in populations that we expect will have a high likelihood of a trauma exposure in the future. 
using a prospective design helps us identify what biological phenotypes were present before trauma exposure and which ones manifest only after exposure. This is an important design to help us understand mechanisms of risk versus mechanisms of symptom development and maintenance. So this brings us to some of the work from our lab in collaboration with a number of other labs to understand PTSD risk. The Marine Resiliency Study was developed as a prospective longitudinal study of biological and physiological risk factors for combat PTSD. This was a field study in which we assessed over 3,500 Marines and Navy corpsmen here at the uh, 29 Palms uh, Marine Base, uh, sort of near Joshua Tree, and what we did is we assessed them before and after a combat deployment. So about one to four weeks prior to the deployment, they went through a four-hour visit with us where we conducted labs. Uh, so we got blood, saliva, and urine for uh, peripheral biomarkers. We had self-report questionnaires of physical and mental health status. We conducted a number of physiological as well as cognitive tests, and I'm going to show you some of those today, as well as clinical assessments. Then about three months and six months after they came back from a seven-month combat deployment to either Iraq or Afghanistan, we reassessed them. And right now, what we have ongoing is an eight to 10-year follow-up study. So, so far from our data, MRS has published a number of papers over the years on biological factors that do and do not predict PTSD risk. I'm not going to have time to go over all of these with you, but I will just highlight a few findings. In this cohort, one of the primary predictors of PTSD was traumatic brain injury, traumatic brain injury either before or during the trauma, which increases risk about two to three times. Other studies, such as Army STARS, have also observed similar increases in risk. Our lab identified a number of physiological risk factors, such as heart rate variability, threat response, and sleep that I'm going to show you today. Finally, the study supported a number of findings of blood-based biomarkers of PTSD, including biomarkers of immune signaling changes and also the first uh, large study of risk genes for PTSD. So in terms of the, the individual risk factors I'm going to be talking about, I first want to talk to you about how trauma not only affects, inter affects and interacts with the brain, but the body as well. Trauma affects the body through altering both the immune system as well as the autonomic nervous system that controls bodily functions such as heart rate. Physical trauma and severe emotional trauma can induce immune system activation in the periphery, which can then induce increases in inflammation in the brain. We know from animal studies that this trauma-induced inflammatory process can mediate changes in behavior, including increased avoidance, arousal, and depression-related behaviors. Trauma also affects the autonomic nervous system, shifting the system at least acutely into fight or flight through driving the sympathetic nervous system. So we know that these systems are engaged during and after trauma, but we don't know if individual differences in how these systems work uh, may affect risk once one is exposed to trauma. So to examine autonomic function, we can assess changes in heart rate variability. The autonomic nervous system is made up of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And these two systems compete to control organ function. The sympathetic nervous system is most uh, strong during fight or flight or threat, where the parasympathetic nervous system is considered sort of the controls organ at, uh, at rest. The sympathetic system becomes dominant during threat, increasing heart rate, slowing gastric functions, and preparing the body to either fight or flee. We can assess which system is more dominant by looking at changes in heart rate over time, termed heart rate variability. In the marine resiliency study, we examined if differences in autonomic function before trauma exposure predicts chances of developing PTSD. So to test this question, we used heart rate variability, which allows us to assess how much sympathetic versus parasympathetic signaling is happening in the body at rest. We found that people with a ratio of more sympathetic control over heart rate when at rest were about 50% more likely to develop PTSD after a combat deployment. This finding was later replicated in an army cohort, suggesting that individuals with higher sympathetic drive may be more at risk for developing PTSD if they are exposed to a traumatic event. Another group of MRS investigators examined the role of immune signaling and risk for PTSD. Remember that PTSD is associated with increased inflammation in the periphery, 
but whether this was associated with PTSD symptoms or was a marker of risk was unknown. Dr. Baker found that increased inflammation as measured by C-reactive protein, which is an innate immune factor created by the liver, predicts increased risk for developing PTSD symptoms after a combat deployment. So the more CRP that is in the body, which is an indicator, again, of sort of body inflammation, the more likely it was for people to develop PTSD symptoms during that combat deployment. These data suggest that an individual with higher inflammation or immune signaling at rest may be more at risk. Other laboratories have gone on to show that the CRP gene and genes associated with increased CRP in plasma are also associated with PTSD risk, suggesting that CRP signaling itself could have some contribution to PTSD risk. However, we need to remember that these studies show correlations between certain risk factors like heart rate variability and immune signaling with future PTSD diagnoses, but they do not establish a causal effect. In order to establish a causal effect, we would have to manipulate these systems in people and then expose them to trauma and see who does and doesn't develop PTSD. We obviously can't do those experiments in people, but we can begin to assess causality in experimental systems like animal models. And this is the second aspect of my laboratory, is to translate between associations we are finding between biological systems, such as sympathetic nervous system and immune signaling and PTSD risk, into preclinical models to dissect if these systems truly contribute to risk or perhaps are just simply associated with some other unknown system that is causal for PTSD risk. So in our lab, we have gone on to study how removal of the CRP gene or overexpression of this gene affects encoding of trauma memories and recovery in animals. To measure trauma memories, we use fear conditioning models where an animal is taught to acquire an association between an aversive or traumatic event like a foot shock and an environmental cue like a tone. So every time they hear a tone, they get a little foot shock to their feet. After they have acquired the association, they, they learn that the tone predicts the foot shock, we give them 24 hours, and then we have them undergo extinction training. And so in order to have extinction training, what we do is we give them the tone multiple times, but now it no longer predicts a foot shock. Then we let them rest for another 24 hours and we examine how much extinction recall they have. For us to understand how much fear conditioning they have, we measure their freezing behavior, which is very common in prey animals in response to threat. So in an ongoing project, we are finding that loss of the CRP gene, so we actually mutated the mice for the, the gene to be deleted, those mice actually recover much quicker. They have better extinction training or extinction learning um, than wild type mice or control mice. And the next day, their fear is much less, again, than, um, than wild-type mice, which is suggestive that CRP may play a role in actually inhibiting um, extinction learning and extinction recall. But we have a lot more work to do on this project to understand how CRP might affect fear responses and memories. But this is an example of how we are trying to establish what systems play a causal role in PTSD once they have been identified in human studies. So I want to now go back to the brain mechanism slide that I discussed before. We have discussed some of the body-based risk factors, but let's go back to that threat circuit. As I mentioned, one of the key features of PTSD is the increased responses to the trauma memory. And in some people, these responses do not go away or extinguish over time. It has been unclear if this increased response to the trauma memory happens due to exposure to the trauma or if this is based on individual differences in their ability to encode and retain aversive memories. It could also be differences in how quickly responses to the memory are extinguished. So people that may not be able to extinguish well may be more at risk for developing PTSD. In MRS, we used a laboratory measure of threat or fear memory to examine individual differences in fear learning and extinction processes and how those might contribute to PTSD risk. So to measure fear memories in the laboratory, we use what is called a fear potentiated startle task. In this task, it's very simple. Uh, participants are presented with colored shapes on the computer screen, either a blue or a yellow circle. Every time they get a blue circle, they get a, a rather surprising and aversive air blast to the throat. It isn't painful, but it is aversive and people really don't like it. Every time they see a yellow circle, nothing happens. They quickly learn that every time the blue circle comes on, they're about to get an air puff. And when the yellow circle comes on, they're not going to receive anything. 
And what happens is as that blue circle shows up over time, they start to get more and more anxious. And we can measure how anxious they get by examining how much they startle when they see that blue circle as compared to how much they startle when they see that yellow circle. We measure startle by looking at the eye blink, so the actual muscle contractions of their eye in response to a startling stimulus. As you can see, after only a few trials, people quickly show anxious responses, so more startle reactivity to those blue circles than they do the yellow. Once we have established that there is uh, fear conditioning, what we then do is look at extinction learning. And again, just like in the mice, what we do is we show them that blue circle now, which predicted that aversive event before, but now it no longer predicts it. They never get an air blast after they see that blue circle. And what we see with repeated trials over time is that their conditioned fear or that startle reactivity during those blue circles diminishes exponentially. And so that enables us to measure how much fear acquisition they have as well as how much fear extinction they have. And we can see if their performance across this task is predictive of their risk for developing PTSD. Yep, just a minute. My computer wants to think about something before it moves on to the next slide. It's giving me the blue circle. Oh dear, okay, it's, oh, nope, there we go. All right, we got it back. Okay, so first what we did is we looked to see what this phenotype looks like um, across our participants in the marine resiliency study that had PTSD and those that did not. So what, is, what do these phenotypes look like um, when someone has symptoms versus when they do not? And so here is the acquisition uh, session here on the left. And what you can see is people that do not have PTSD, they have very good um, discrimination between uh, fear responses to that blue circle versus the yellow circle. But people with PTSD, they're not able to discriminate as well. They have a lot more res um, fear response to that safety signal, actually the, the cue that did not predict very well the, uh, the aversive stimulus. And so that's, um, that's a phenotype actually that's been replicated by other groups as well. So there's this overgeneralization of the threat response to cues that are not terribly predictive of the aversive event. And then if we look at extinction here, um, what we see is uh, on the right in the dark blue, you see the controls diminish their extinction over time, or excuse me, diminish their conditioned fear over time. But the PTSD group showed uh, less extinction, so they were not able to diminish their condition fear with as many trials. So I'm trying to get to the next slide. There we go. So what we have here, um, now what we did was we removed anyone um, that had PTSD and we looked just at pre-deployment. And when we looked at pre-deployment, we took everyone that was healthy at pre-deployment, but then we separated them into those that went on to develop PTSD and those that did not. So the data that I'm showing you, this group here that says PTSD, they actually were healthy at the time this data was collected, but they went on to develop PTSD. And so what we see here is that during acquisition, the PTSD group, again, they, they actually didn't have symptoms at that time, but they already were showing this sort of poor discrimination um, between the, the condition cue and the safety cue. So that seems like it may be a risk factor for developing PTSD. When we looked at extinction, we didn't actually see any differences um, with people that went on to develop PTSD and those that did not, with indicating that extinction it seems to be something that is deficient only after uh, trauma exposure and development of PTSD symptoms, while this difference in uh, conditioned Q learning um, seems to be a risk factor. So I'm trying to go to the next slide, and it's... Would it help if, uh, if I share them? Uh, would that be easier? Yeah, it finally gets to it. It's just very slow. There we go. Okay. 
So just to summarize, I've shown a number of potential risk factors for PTSD, which include dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, inflammation, and disruption in fear learning, particularly overgeneralization of fear learning. So one last risk factor I want to go over is the role of sleep in PTSD risk. Sleep disorders are highly comorbid with PTSD, with approximately 70% of patients with a sleep complaint. But does sleep quality affect PTSD symptom development and maintenance? And if so, what might be the mechanism? So in the Marine Resiliency Study, we examined the role of self-reported sleep quality before deployment on risk for PTSD symptoms post-deployment. We used a rather complicated statistical model called the latent variable cross-lag model. It's a big mouthful. What this model allows for is allows us to examine the relationship between variables from one time point to a future time point, while also accounting for their correlations at a specific at the same time point. So we can get an idea of how predictive they are outside of their ability to predict symptoms at the same time point. Can they predict symptoms at a later time point? And what we did is we looked at self-reported uh, sleep disturbance across pre and the three months and six months post deployment. And we also looked at re-experiencing symptoms. So one of the primary symptoms in PTSD. And what we found, if you look at this, um, at, at this line here, sleep disturbances at pre-deployment significantly predicted increases in re-experiencing symptoms after deployment. Interestingly, the three month sleep disturbances, so this is post deployment, also predicted later re-experiencing symptoms. So from this, we can get that sleep disturbances before deployment have some predictive quality for, re for showing more re-experiences after a trauma, but sleep disturbances after trauma also predict later chronicity or increasing symptoms um, even after the trauma has occurred. So what mechanism might sleep disturbances interfere with this PTSD risk, as well as interfere with recovery. So in order to ask this question, we next conducted a study uh, in healthy controls with Sean Drummond's lab. And what we wanted to do was examine perhaps a causal role of sleep disruption in fear extinction in, health, in healthy controls to get at the question of whether sleep may be disrupting this important process, and perhaps that's a mechanism for PTSD, its effects on PTSD risk. What we did is we disrupted sleep, so 24-hour sleep disruption, before extinction training. And the next day, we examined participants' extinction recall. And in this highly controlled laboratory study, we found that sleep disruption, which is experienced, again, by most uh, people after they have experienced a trauma um, and also by PTSD patients, could be interfering in their ability to retain extinction learning. So those with sleep disruption, had much less, had much greater conditioned fear even after extinction training. So this reduction in extinction learning could then reduce recovery after trauma. In other words, increase risk as well as reduce the treatment efficacy of extinction-based therapies. So we then went on to observe that REM, REM or rapid eye uh, movement sleep phase appeared to be the most important sleep phase for good extinction performance. So we found high correlations with how much REM someone had at night with their extinction performance the next day. And so this suggests to us that sleep may be modifiable and an important risk factor for PTSD. In particular, we may want to concentrate on modifying uh, REM. There are now a number of studies ongoing at the San Diego VA and elsewhere to examine the effects, for example, of sleep intervention. So if we increase sleep and diminish sleep disorders, um, in conjunction with adjunctive therapy, like exposure therapy, do enhance the efficacy of those therapies. And that's being conducted by uh, Peter Colvinen at, uh, at the VA in San Diego. So to summarize the studies I showed you today on PTSD risk, there are a number of potential risk factors for PTSD, including increased sympathetic drive, increased inflammation, and alterations in fear learning. Sleep disruption um, are also risk factors, which may be mediated in part through their effects on fear learning and extinction processes. Other risk factors I did not discuss today are potentially hyperreactive stress hormone signaling, as well, of course, a number of risk genes, which um, have recently in just the last year or two been identified in two very large genome-wide association studies. Um, and so these are risk factors, although these risk factors alone um, none of these genes or inflammation, none of these are predictive enough for clinical use by themselves. 
there are now some ongoing approaches to try examining if putting some of these together, especially those that are more easily measurable in the clinic, such as CRP, which is commonly measured in the, in the clinic, as well as uh, heart rate variability, as well as potentially gene mutations, if a combination of these risk factors will enable us to develop a risk calculator, sort of similar to the Framingham risk calculator for cardiovascular disease. So for the last 10 minutes of my talk, I wanted to go back to more broad discussion of what current treatments are available and what is on the horizon. The field has recognized that new treatments have been very slow in coming, partly due to lack of support for large clinical trials. But that seems to be changing now. So current medications, what are the gold standard uh, treatments? These are primarily serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, such as escitalopram. Prazosin is used for arousal and nightmares, and in some uh, more rare cases, antipsychotics and mood stabilizers may be prescribed. Behavioral therapies that have strong evidence base are cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So these therapies are different, but many of them have a component of extinction-based therapy in them. So what's in development? In terms of pharmacotherapy, uh, esketamine and transcranial magnetic stimulation are now being studied for use in PTSD. These have FDA approval for depression, but not for PTSD, although they may be being used off-label uh, for people with PTSD that is comorbid uh, with depression. Some therapies that are in the pipeline for phase two trials are FA inhibitors, which boosts the endogenous ligands in your body that activate the cannabinoid receptor, such as anandamide. There are also trials ongoing at the glucocorticoid receptor, a stress hormone receptor. And if you're interested, um, there you can look at clinicaltrials.gov, which lists ongoing clinical trials for PTS treatments in the U.S., and you'll see quite a large number of these trials. Some of them are small, and some of them are quite big. So what do we know about these current treatments, and how can we improve them? Current behavioral therapies are effective for about 50% of patients, and they're helpful in that they train the patient to reframe their response to the trauma and support extinction processes. They are very difficult for the individual, however, as they must recount their trauma repeatedly, and this is very hard. And they also require significant healthcare resources. Pharmacotherapeutics are also about 50% effective, and they are good at dampening symptoms although some are left untreated and they do not produce, un and they produce unwanted side effects. They also typically must be taken chronically as they do not support long-term coping or new learning. So the shift in our thinking is that we need to develop pharmacotherapeutics that can support and maintain advances made with behavioral therapy. Basically pharmacotherapeutics that support neuroplasticity. So the idea for these adjunctive therapeutics is that if given during extinction or other uh, therapies, the drug facilitates the new learning that is occurring during those therapies and helps facilitate the retention of, those, of that learning. Thus, it, re it facilitates potentially a rewiring of the brain as opposed to just simply dampening or treating uh, symptoms and then must be used chronically. Again, this allows that the patient may take the medication just for a limited period of time just during those uh, therapeutic sessions. And that then mediates many or uh, removes many of the problems that we have with uh, chronic drug treatment, such as unwanted side effects, as well as tolerance. So there's a nice example of, um, of this kind of paradigm shift, and it's probably one of the more exciting uh, adjunctive treatments uh, that we've seen on the horizon is uh, MDMA therapy. So this was just reported this year. This was a, a phase three clinical trial. And what this trial did is it examined the efficacy of MDMA treatment, about 80 milligrams, during three different sessions of manualized eight-hour therapy with two therapists in attendance. So this is a pretty long and intense therapy. In between treatment sessions, uh, different weeks, they also received integrated therapy. So to go over uh, the types of, of events that occurred during those uh, treatment sessions. And really the effect size of the reduction of PTSD symptoms at the 18 week mark was really quite remarkable. It's about a Cohen's D of one, which is about the largest ever seen with a pharmacotherapeutic trial. There were also strong effects on global function, uh, which, is, which was also very heartening. The mechanism of action of these effects is unknown, 
Although we know in animals, MDMA facilitates fear extinction. That's one suggestion is that MDMA in this case may be enhancing extinction learning during those eight hour therapeutic sessions. It also may have enhanced the alliance between the patient and therapist through its pro-social effects. It could actually be doing both and maybe that's why it's so effective. I should just give one caveat, which is that 90% of the patients were able to accurately predict whether they were on the drug versus placebo. This is a, a fairly psychoactive compound. Thus, blinding was in question here. Nevertheless, the very strong effect size is quite exciting and we await further testing. The FDA has assigned the treatment breakthrough status, which will fast track it through the approval process. Oh, and my slides have decided to stop again. Almost there. Come on. Should we try from my end? Yeah, maybe. It seems to have. Did you, yeah, it just, it just closed. Go ahead. Okay, so. Sorry about this. Of course, the computer decides to. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, so go ahead and, and hit click next. Yeah. Okay, so another treatment um, that we've been interested in our lab is oxytocin. And what we, um, we became interested in, in oxytocin because in animal studies, um, oxytocin treatment happens to uh, improve extinction learning as well as extinction recall. So what we did is we looked in a similar task that I showed you uh, before with the sleep deprivation, is instead we gave oxytocin intranasally to half our participants before they went through extinction training the other half got placebo. And the next day, we looked at how much extinction recall they had. And what we found was those that got that intranasal oxytocin showed greater extinction recall. Okay, so next, click it again. No, yeah. And so then, um, about two years later, another group uh, looked at what could be the mechanism for this effect. And they found that oxytocin treatment during extinction training actually facilitated activation of that prefrontal cortex that region that inhibits uh, the amygdala during extinction. And they also showed reductions in amygdala activity. And so, okay, one more click. Yeah, and so um, what's kind of exciting is that now uh, there is another group that has moved on to test the efficacy of this intranasal oxytocin uh, treatment as an adjunctive therapy for exposure therapy. So again, looking at whether oxytocin treatment will enhance extinction-based therapies. And that's a, a study being as supported by the VA. Okay, next slide. So there are plenty of other drug classes that are being uh, targeted for this potential adjunctive treatment approach with behavioral therapy. Uh, so there are uh, cannabinoid or endocannabinoids um, are of interest. So for example, the VA is now studying the effects of cannabidiol to enhance extinction therapy. Um, there's also the potential for other uh, cannabinoid receptor one agonists. Um, especially that are more in sort of proof of concept, uh, improving extinction um, as well as altering the threat circuit during uh, extinction learning and healthy controls. Um, I just showed you the really impressive MDMA effects uh, with the manualized therapy. Also, uh, neuropeptides, oxytocin, I just showed you that. And also dopamine signaling uh, compounds, so methylphenidate as well as L-DOPA, which enhance dopamine signaling are uh, of interest because they also have shown uh, enhancement of extinction uh, both in animals and in people. And I believe there is an L-DOPA trial going on now. Uh, there's also a trial of estrogen improving exposure therapy in women. So, we, so uh, Mohamed Malad's uh, lab has shown that estrogen treatment enhances extinction specifically in women. There have also been a number of failures, I should note. So decycloserine, which is a, a a cognitive enhancer that enhances glutamate signaling and was really one of the first compounds to be tried, which had a, a lot of um, potential, at least from animal studies and certainly early phase one, 
Um, but when it was combined with exposure therapy for PTSD, it really didn't show uh, efficacy. And there's also a recent study trying to look at whether TMS um, in conjunction with exposure therapy, uh, so tra tra transcranial magnetic uh, brain stimulation, whether that was effective, and they found that it was not. Um, but there may be reasons for that because TMS um, has very specific parameters as well as um, where, what brain regions it's targeting. And so it may be that swapping out those parameters might improve its efficacy. Um, okay, so next slide. Okay, so this is the final slide. Um, so this is the overview and discussion. So I just want to sort of remind you some of the key highlights of what we went over today. So we've identified a number of risk factors for PTSD, and these could potentially inform interventions as well as mechanism. And again, the next step is really refining these risk factors to establish if there's any clinical utility. Okay, next. A number of these risk factors are also potentially modifiable, like sleep. Okay, next one. And also, there are, you know, there are many promising future treatments awaiting larger definitive clinical trials. So really, we need to keep an eye out, especially for MDMA and S-ketamine. Okay, go ahead, next one. And so we, what we have are that there are these parallel lines of research for both novel monotherapies that I talked to you about, as well as these adjunctive treatment there with, in conjunction with behavioral therapies. So there, you know, the field has really moved towards trying a number of different approaches uh, to be able to start addressing um, uh, PTSD that is not being treated well uh, by our current treatments. And there is one slide um, that also has resources for, uh, if you go to, yeah, that has resources for seeking treatment and uh, therapists. Um, I just want to highlight that there are a number of organizations that can help you do this, and I believe these slides are going to be uploaded. Um, so you can go ahead and use these links to uh, look for therapists in your area. And I should just highlight also that um, it's a little bit larger font, the treatment decision aid, which um, is put out through the VA National Center. And that particular, um, that particular link is very good because it's a very nice sort of primer on the different kinds of treatments that are available, both pharmacotherapeutic and helping you understand and potentially decide on what treatment might be best for you. Okay, so if you want to go ahead back one slide, and I can go ahead and, and start answering questions. Great. Well, Vicki, I want to thank you for an excellent presentation for all the work that you've been doing on such an important topic. So thank you so much. Um, I, I want to start off by asking about something that uh, we received a few questions on this, which is the issue of uh, substance misuse, uh, chemical dependency, as a co-occurring condition with PTSD. Could you speak a little bit about that for us? Sure. So it's uh, substance use is highly comorbid uh, with uh, PTSD, especially alcohol and uh, and cannabis use. Um, and we know if there's substance use, it uh, most definitely in terms of epidemiologically, uh, makes it much more difficult for people to recover. Um, we have been finding from, um, from people such as Sonia Norman at the VA National Center that uh, some of our gold standard treatments, such as exposure therapy, they are quite effective in, uh, in substance use users. So um, it's not, there used to be a fear that this exposure therapy might induce people to self-medicate more, um, and that actually hasn't turned out to be the case. Um, so that's, that's sort of good news. Um, there's a growing concern about increasing use of cannabis, and um, we certainly see that quite a bit here in California, um, to self-medicate. And, um, you know, cannabis, there's a, there's a lot of, of information out there that cannabis might have some efficacy, you know, from these, some of these early phase one studies that are very controlled, uh, looking at improvements in extinction or also dampening some of that threat circuit activity. But we also have a pretty good literature that indicates that at least those that have cannabis use disorder, again, have a higher, a harder time recovering. And I should just note that heavy use, especially of cannabis, um, what it actually does is it, it creates the, the receptor, the cannabinoid 1 receptor, 
to downregulate. And so it's no longer available at the neuron for the drug to act. And what that means is the person isn't getting any more efficacy um, from the, the cannabis use. And that use can also, um, upon withdrawal, you can have very long-term sleep effects, um, very lo long-term difficulty in getting to sleep and insomnia um, after, after heavy cannabis use. And so we really need to wait for um, better studies to get an idea and get a handle on what formulations are going to be the best. Um, you know, and what kinds of doses and what kinds of treatments are going to be the best. Because right now we know that uh, it can also have a very detrimental effect if it's used inappropriately. Good. Thank you for making those points. And, you know, I, I think that sometimes people believe that just because it's been legalized, it may be okay in certain situations, but you just described how it actually could be quite detrimental. Yeah, and there are studies um, that clearly show uh, that heavy cannabis use in people, pet studies, uh, you see this um, very strong down regulation of these receptors. And so it's really um, counterproductive uh, to, to have heavy use. And so we just, we really don't know enough about it. Um, I think, you know, the concern that, and I, I think if you go back, for example, the MDMA paper, um, if people go back to that paper, um, there is some discussion um, and some follow-up of whether people, you know, went out and tried uh, to use MDMA in different contexts, and I believe they, they didn't. And so that's also something that's going to have to be closely monitored um, with these studies, which is to, to understand if there, there is kind of, you know, any increase in use outside of, of uh, you know, when it's being monitored by the physician. Good. Thank you. We, we have a, a question from a, a veteran who served in Afghanistan, and I hope the person is still listening, and I want to thank you and anybody else who's listening who has served our country. And the, the question is um, that, uh, as, that the, more, the recent news from Afghanistan um, has been in, extremely unsettling for this person. And I'm curious yeah. if you could speak a little bit about that issue um, for both for this individual and for others who may be listening in, in similar kind of situation. Yes. So um, we, you know, we're we're um, working with the the Marines that participated in our Marine Resiliency Study now, and um, you know, we're we're doing a lot of. Um, clinical interviews with them. And this is coming up a lot. And what's happening is, is it's removing um, some of the meaning to their, you know, what they're thinking is the meaning to their um, experience. And what we need to remember uh, is that everyone at that time was doing the very best that they could. And that's all we can really ask, right, of anyone. And so what happens in the future, we, we can't predict. We just don't know. And so people need to remember that they did their absolute best at that time. And they need to think about, you know, all of the positive things that happened um, during their military career. And they need to, and that's some of the, what some of the resources from the VA uh, PTC National Center discusses are ways to re reframe and rethink about um, your experience so that, that this particular event, you know, doesn't, doesn't overshadow all of the good uh, that, that those people have done. And again, thank you very much for uh, his service. Thank you, all very, very good points. You spoke at the beginning um, about another timely issue, which is COVID and the high percentage of people who've been hospitalized who develop PTSD. Could you speak a little bit more about that and also for those who develop COVID but haven't been hospitalized, even if it wasn't as severe, but other people within the context of the pandemic. Right. So, of course, people can develop PTSD from seeing their, their loved one injured or die. Um, and so, it's, you know, I didn't mention, but there's also going to be higher rates of PTSD symptoms in, um, you know, in family members and caregivers. Uh, for those that either ended up with with COVID-19 um, and you know it was very severe, but they recovered, um, or they or if they did uh, pass away, and 
you know, for healthcare workers, this is just a consistent ongoing onslaught, right? Um, and so we're going to see, I think, uh, this is going to be a severe problem. It, it kind of reminds me of when we knew during the Afghanistan war, um, you know, and we started monitoring veterans, um, that, you know, PTSD was going to be a huge problem in the years coming forward. And it's, it's going to potentially be the same. And I, what I really want to make a point is there are studies now, and I, I highlighted a few, um, that are looking at the risk factors. And these are, many of these risk factors are modifiable. So, especially in healthcare workers. So, um, lack of experience or a non-safe work environment if they felt they weren't being protected, as well as lack of social support. Those were all the highest risk, risk factors for healthcare workers to then develop uh, PTSD symptoms. And these are all things that, you know, that their institutions, um, as well as their uh, their loved ones um, and their colleagues can help with. And so I think we need to to really sort of pay attention to those risk factors and start monitoring them um, so that we can intervene early um, and prevent uh, PTSD. And that's why, that's why, you know, this epidemiological study, the risk factors are, are so important. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, one final question. If yes. somebody experiences a traumatic event, um, a car accident, uh, being assaulted, um, it, all of the events that, that you described on, on the list, um, what should they do as a step to try to decrease the risk of developing PTSD to minimize the impact of that traumatic event? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, uh, some of this extinction process, right? Which is a lot of it is talking about the trauma, talking about it with loved ones, uh, with a therapist, um, being able to expose yourself to uh, the cues. Um, those are going to potentially help um, and reduce as as well as getting more social support. So, you know, being able to go to more people, um, both about the trauma, but also just generally having more social support. Those are, are pretty key features, and we especially found that in veterans, the social support was important as well as in uh, healthcare workers. So I think reaching out um, early is really the, one of the most important steps someone can take. Thank you, very good advice with regards to that. People should not suffer in silence. Um, they should seek help from family, friends, a support system, and certainly professional help as well. Absolutely. Vicki, I want to thank you again for taking the time to speak with us, sharing this important information, and most importantly, for the ongoing work that you and members of your team have been doing on this important issue. So thank you so very, very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity, and I really appreciate all of the people that attended. This was great. Thank you. I also want to thank everybody who joined us as well. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All of the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call us at 800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Ned Kalin, the Hedberg Professor and Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin will present Early Life Risk for Pathological Anxiety. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, October 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you for joining us. Have a good day.